Hello, I'm Benita Zarillo, the NDP Member of Parliament for Port Moody Coquitlam. And we're here today because for too long, flight attendants, who are disproportionately women, have been working up to 35 hours a week unpaid. At the same time, the big airlines have been raking in billions in profits, and their executives have been taking in millions in executive bonuses. And the Liberals have let this happen. The NDP say, no, this isn't fair. Unpaid work won't fly. And with that, I'd like to introduce the leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh. Thanks so much, Benita. I got to thank Benita for all the great work she's doing and all the workers that have been raising this very important issue. As Benita said, it is absolutely wrong that a worker goes into work for a highly profitable company and doesn't get paid for the work that they're doing. And as Benita mentioned, a majority, a disproportionate number of these workers are, are women, and women sadly know all too well about unpaid work. So we want to send a clear message to the government. This is wrong. We need you to fix this. We are standing in full solidarity with these workers, demanding a fix to the situation. Highly profitable companies where CEOs are making huge bonuses should not be exploiting workers for their unpaid work. This is happening in airlines across our country, and it needs to end. On a un message clair aujourd'hui. C'est clair que on a des travailleurs et travailleuses qui travaillent et sont non rémunérés. C'est inacceptable, particulièrement parce que ces entreprises font des, des profits massifs et particulièrement parce que la grande majorité ou un grand nombre de ces travailleurs sont des femmes. Et malheureusement, les femmes connaissent bien la réalité du travail non rémunéré. Donc, on va on va un message clair aujourd'hui a message où on supporte, on appuie ces travailleurs et on demande que le gouvernement travaille ensemble avec ces travailleurs et travailleuses pour régler ce problème immédiatement. With that, I want to pass the mic to Wesley Lasovsky, who is a flight attendant, and he's going to share his, uh, his words on this matter. Wesley, thanks so much. Thank you, Jagmeet, and thank you, Benita. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Wesley Lasovsky, and I'm a proud Air Canada flight attendant of 22 years. I am President of the Airline Division of the Canadian Union of Public Employees, which represents 18,500 flight attendants at 10 different airlines across Canada. We're here today talking about an industry practice that CEOs of our airlines would probably prefer to keep in the dark, and that is the rampant abuse of unpaid work in our industry. When most Canadians go to their job, whether they're a paramedic or an electrician or a barista, they start getting paid once they put on their uniform, clock in, and start working. But in our industry, as a general rule, Airlines do not start compensating us until the plane is in motion, which is usually hours after we've begun our actual work. And when the plane stops, so does our time on the clock. Think of the last trip you took at the airport and how much time you spent queuing for security, waiting at your gate, sitting through bags getting loaded and safety demonstrations, waiting for the doors to close, the plane to push off, and then waiting to deplane once you've landed. For flight attendants, these aren't things we experience en route to a family vacation once a year. These are the hours and hours we work for free, often performing critical safety-related tasks every single day when we go to work. And it all adds up. Today, many of my members are working a grueling full-time schedule, but still making less than $30,000 a year. That is simply unconscionable. On average, flight attendants in Canada work for free for 35 hours every month. For most Canadians, that translates to a full week every month in free labour for their employer. Imagine working three months a year for free. I think of another line of work, I can, pardon me, I can't think of another line of work where this would be acceptable. But for Canada's multi-billion dollar airlines, it's simply business as usual. And the worst part is, as the laws are currently written, all of this is legal. And so far, it doesn't seem like the Trudeau government is in a hurry to help us either. But that is why we're here today. Abusive industry practices thrive in the darkness. And we are here to shine a light. So the airline executives can no longer hide in the dark and so that our elected officials can no longer pretend they didn't know this kind of abuse was going on. For the better part of a year, we have been reaching out to MPs and we are so grateful for the support we have received from our friends in the NDP who join us here today. But as I mentioned, the Liberals think if they stay still and don't move or say anything, no one will see them and they can stay neutral. But let's be clear, when multi-billion dollar companies are ripping off their own employees of dozen of hours of free labour every month, saying you're neutral actually means you're cho you've chosen a side. We urge the government to reconsider their position. They can close gaps in the Labour Code to prohibit this kind of abuse. They can work with us instead of against us. 
but one way or another, we're going to end this outdated and unjust practice, the easy way or the hard way, with or without them. Unpaid work simply will not fly any longer. That's the message we want to bring to government to hear from us today. Thank you, and I'd like to Ali, uh, pardon me, introduce Alia Hussain. Thank you, Leslie. My name is Alia Hussain, and I'm the president of QP4070, representing cabin crew at Weshet, Encore, and Swoop. I'm a proud flight attendant of 17 years. When the pandemic hit, flight attendants were among the first to get sick. We were also among the first to lose our jobs. We've endured very hard four years of fighting our way back from COVID. When air travel did resume, the landscape completely changed. Anyone who has flown in the past few years has seen it. The delays are longer and the cancellations are more frequent. Passengers are more unruly and they're understandably frustrated because like everything else in life, the price is only going up. I'd ask you to put all of yourselves in our shoes in this situation. For flight attendants, we've never, wor we've never been working so hard to take home so little at the end of an 18-hour day. Our airlines have never extracted more free labor from us than they are now, and at a time when the paychecks we are taking home are getting us less and less because of inflation. We're getting crushed by corporate greed at seemingly every angle. Now, as flight attendants, part of the job is to be patient and polite. We are good at maintaining a professional smile and composure while navigating through challenging situations. But on the issue of unpaid work, it's possible that we've been a bit too polite and a bit too patient. We love our jobs, but we are not volunteers. And our employers are not entitled to our free labor. It might be time for the airline industry and our elected officials to remember. As workers, we have bargaining rights which are protected by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And if these very successful corporations and government can't acknowledge what's happening in our industry is simply wrong and cannot continue, and if they won't work with us to fix it, then no one should be surprised if we see a bit of industry turbulence on the horizon. No pun intended. Thank you for all being here. We have a few moments for your questions. Thanks so much. And, and we're ready to take your questions. I'll pass that to, to the representatives. So anyone want to answer that? Hi, thank you for the question. Uh, so expecting labor action at the onset? No, we definitely want to bargain with our employers and, and follow the correct course of action with that when we go into bargaining periods. Okay. There have been a number of stories recently about passengers with disabilities who've had issues boarding planes, deplaning. I wonder if uh, the issue of only getting paid when the plane is in motion, if that is perhaps contributing to that, and if you were getting paid the full time, if that could help this issue at all? I think paying flight attendants uh, appropriately for training, uh, enable proper training uh, to go through, would assist with that kind of stuff. Currently, our pay structure is half pay um, or minimum wage for payment for that kind of stuff. A lot of it's online learning uh, to cut down on costs and stuff like that. So yeah, it could definitely make a change for sure. I, I hate to take us off topic, but I will. Um, I was rereading the SACA agreement. I noticed that the... I, I let folks know that this might happen, so it's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the remaining items on the to-do list in SACA are getting fewer and fewer. Uh, I know you've talked a lot about, the, win, a lot about the, the numerous wins you've secured under the agreement, dental care, mm -hmm. pharma care. But what does the future of supply and confidence look like to you, given there's only a year left in this agreement? Well, right now, our, our focus is on, there's there's some items that remain, but really it's about the implementation of what we fought for. So we fought to make sure people get dental care. We want to see that actually work. I want to see seniors get that care. And we're seeing that happen right now. I've, I've had incredibly emotional stories where I've sat with, with patients in their chair at the dentist, with a dentist and a denturist. I remember meeting with Susan who said, I just want my smile back. She lost her teeth because of cancer, and she's got... Uh, her, her teeth are in, in, in a very difficult position right now with her teeth have fallen out, her roots are still there, it, it's, it's really painful and it's really difficult for her. And she was told that she was going to get her smile back by the denturist and the dentist. And, and that's, that's what I want to see more of. I want to see their program roll out and be delivered. We know that the next phase is going to start in a couple of days for children, uh, 18 and under, and people living with disabilities. We want to see that phase roll out. I want to see kids get care. And we know with PharmaCare, we still need to make sure that bill is passed, and then we want provinces uh, to be able to negotiate, and we want to see people getting that coverage. We know that can happen as soon as the fall if we stay on this and keep on pushing. I want to see people in our country get access to free birth control. I want to see people get access to dent di uh, diabetes, medication, and devices, and I want to see people going to the dentist and getting 
their teeth looked after. So that's what I'm focused on now is making sure people see that benefit in their lives, and then we'll look uh, to the next phase of the, of the agreement. I was also hoping you could speak to your party's decision to deny unanimous consent to the conservative motion yesterday that was spent the passage of C-70 through the House. Your party has been more than willing to help, you know, get the budget bill at committee and the pharmacare bill, help, help those bills move along. What gave you pause on, on C-70? We are working with uh, our House leaders, working with the other House leaders to speed this through the House. We also want to make sure we have experts providing uh, their, their advice on how to best improve the bill so that we are protecting people. Our goal throughout any discussion about foreign interference has always been what is in the best interest of Canadians. If you look at the track record, Conservatives have wanted to play politics and play games and use committees to play score points on foreign interference. We said we needed a public inquiry. This is not something about scoring political points. It's about protecting democracy. So our position has been very serious, and we've taken this very seriously throughout. And we want to make sure that we are passing bills, but also hearing from experts to ensure that we are making sure Canadians are best protected. What are you going to hear from experts about this bill? Is there any, are there any particular issues that you have or questions that you have that need to be addressed? Our, our general principle is that we have seen, through hearing experts' testimony, we've improved bills. Uh, this matter is very serious. We do want to accelerate it through the House, so we want to get it done as quickly as possible, and we are doing that. We are working to make sure there's speedy passage. We do want to hear back uh, any feedback that could improve protection for Canadians. That overall principle, if you see throughout our, our response to foreign interference, has always been what can we do to ensure Canadians are protected? How do we take this away from partisanship but make it about protecting democracy? And so we are very much continuing that same tradition. Over the last few days, there's been a bit of a debate over the debate over consumer carbon pricing after the PBO admitted that they had accidentally included uh, the industrial price in their analysis of the consumer price. Uh, the Liberals say that proves their point. The PBO says that his uh, conclusion that given the economic and fiscal impact, more people would see a net loss. What is your take on that? What I've, what I've seen when we're discussing the price on, on pollution, the price on carbon, has been uh, two approaches from the Conservatives and the Liberals. The Conservative approach is they don't want to have any rules on polluters. They want big polluters to pollute as much as they want. Dump into the oceans, to the rivers, the lakes, pollute as much as you want, no limit on pollution, no price on pollution. I think that's wrong. I think Canadians agree that we need a plan to tackle the climate crisis that we're up against, and we should have a plan. The Liberals' approach has been that's one that's created division. We've seen them choose, choose sides, give an advantage to the Atlantic region, and, and not provide fairness to other parts of the country. And that's a bad approach. And so what we want in a plan that fights the climate crisis is we want to make sure it actually works. We want to see emissions go down. We want to see it not make life more unaffordable, so we want to see affordability. And we want to see a plan that's fair. And so that's what we are pushing for. What has been highlighted by both the Liberals and Conservatives, the Conservatives have no plan and have no desire to take on the pollution that is an issue. And the Liberals have a plan that's not addressing affordability. We think we can, we can do all of the above. We can make an affordable plan that gives people fairness and actually brings down emissions. Can you provide an update on what concessions you received in support and for supporting the budget? Uh, we, are, we are in this position because we've been able to negotiate a number of things. We've been able to fight for a school food program. That's something that we've pushed this government to do. We brought in a grocery rebate, which was which was doubled and continued. That's something that we fought for and we secured. We were able to get a renter's protection fund, which is to acknowledge the fact that we are losing more homes in our country than are being built. For every one affordable home, 11 affordable homes are being lost. And so we fought for a renter's protection fund to keep people safe in their homes. If you're renting somewhere, there's often this fear that your building will be sold by, and by the owner to a rich corporation that will evict you or demevict or renovict you. That's happened so many times across our country. So we fought for that protection to put in place a renter's protection fund. So renter's protection fund, a school food program, we're able to move forward on pharmacare, which is going to include diabetes, medication, and devices, as well as free birth control. Uh, these are things that are above and beyond what we had secured in our agreement. This is an example of New Democrats fighting and forcing Ottawa to work for you and your families. How do you defend the intent to vote on the conservative motion today about the carbon tax? Uh, we're going to vote against uh, the Conservative motion. Uh, again, the Conservatives have, have, have really made it clear that on affordability, they have one message. Uh, when we hear from people about the cost of living, the high cost of groceries, 
the high cost of their cell phone fees and internet fees, when we hear about the high cost of their rent, again and again it's becoming clear and clear that it is corporate greed that's driving up the cost of living. And liberals and conservatives are doing nothing about corporate greed. They're not willing to take on corporate greed, which is the real driver of cost of living. We're prepared to do that. We're prepared to take on corporate greed. I've got a bill on taking on corporate greed. We'll be putting forward a motion next week for our, our Opposition Day motion, which directly goes after the corporate grocery stores and the fact that they're ripping off Canadians. Uh, I'd like to see which way the conservatives and liberals will vote on addressing the real problem that is hurting the most Canadians right now, which is corporate greed. Canadian should get a break on gas taxes this summer? Well, we believe in uh, taking the GST off of home heating entirely. Um, the Conservatives are proposing a temporary measure. Uh, we believe that there are ways to give people relief. There are ways to bring down the cost of living. Let's do meaningful actions on bringing down the cost of groceries. Let's bring down the cost of cell phone and internet fees, which are completely regulated by the federal government. What the Conservatives are proposing is a couple months of relief. We're proposing significant reduction in your overall cost of living. I think that's a much better plan. Sure, can you go back to C70 for just sure. one second? On, on Pharmacare, you, your party supported time allocation. <coughs> You're okay limiting witness testimony in that case. Why do you need to hear more from experts here? What's, what's the difference? Oh, we're not opposed to time allocation. Uh, we're, we just want to ensure that there is opportunities for witnesses, uh, that we want to make sure that experts are giving us advice. But we are very much open to time allocation and speeding this through, through the House. Thanks so much, Missy. Thank you all. Appreciate you for being here. That was really good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank